Nima, how different would this case be if Rebecca and John, the other two shot in the head, survived, if they had not survived? Now we have none of that uh, direct testimony. It certainly would have been a weaker case for the prosecution, but still, still difficult for the defense. We knew that this defense was going to be self-defense, and we knew that based on the cross-examination. Obviously, defense reserved their opening, so we didn't know exactly what they were going to say, but based on the cross-examination of the missing firearm, Rebecca's gun, and that type of thing, we knew it was going to go in this direction. And also, in these really bad cases for the defense, these murder cases, we know they try to go on the offense, argue that it's a sloppy prosecution, they rush to judgment law enforcement, there's other you know, uh, factors or considerations that didn't come into play. So and that's really what came to fruition. The self-defense, the sloppy law enforcement argument, but ultimately it was unsuccessful. And really it was unsuccessful because those two eyewitnesses were very, very strong. Oh, yeah. um, so, you, you know, know the, it, the whole Josh... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. The whole Josh thing? Yeah, I was going to say... So the whole conspiracy that came out, the alleged conspiracy, purported conspiracy that, you know, James and John were trying to conspire to kill Josh and, you know, the first witness being Rebecca's mother, again, didn't really start strong. Maybe you want to start with the ER nurse as well, because she comes on and she says, you know, obviously, you know, James wouldn't hurt a fly. Again, just poor, poor defense opening and really bad first witness for the defense yeah, as well. When you talk about diazepam, I think most people know that's a Valium or Valium derivative, uh, Nima, I think. What I do like about practicing law is you get to learn so much about little things. You become a little mini expert and having done a case or two on central nervous system depressants like diazepam, Valium, Versed, Halcyon, etc. Um, but do, do, do the jury members need to know a little more about what that is and what it means? Do they need to pull that together a little bit more? A little bit. If that's going to be your argument, you got to connect it. You probably need an expert witness to piece it together. I really didn't like her as a witness, as I mentioned earlier. She, especially as your first witness for the defense, you know, this is a grieving mother. She's just lost her husband. Her daughter was shot in the face. By the grace of God, she survived. So um, to start with her, and you know that she's going to deny making those statements to the ER nurse, going to deny the conspiracy. Um, so, But if you do go that route, you really got to kind of connect those dots, Michael, as you said. You're going to need an expert in there, and the defense didn't do that at all. I think he's going to think twice, maybe do some research before offering to work on anybody's car where there's an, a girlfriend involved and the father. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, no good deed goes unpunished, Michael, right? You know, he's there helping his friend, uh, you know, who has an issue with uh, his daughter's boyfriend. And next thing you know, he's shot in the face, uh, shot in the head, lucky to survive. Obviously, if Joshua wasn't drunk or stayed to finish the job, he'd probably be dead by now. So. Uh, Nima, what do you think about, you know, uh the, the interaction in front of the jury amazes me. You know, there are things that you give an objection and some judges don't want speaking objections where you might say, I object, that's it, you're done. A speaking objection might say, objection, irrelevant. Object, that's it. But these guys, are they're making oral arguments. Yeah, every time I see this judge, I'm just surprised. We always ask, you know, is the judge wearing pants under that robe? This guy doesn't even wear a tie. So... I mean, the objection was, you know, a prior consistent statement, and we lawyers all know, Joey, that doesn't come in. Um, that's hearsay unless the original statement is, you know, impeached or there's some allegation of fabrication or... So I think what this judge was trying to do is tell the defense counsel, hey, you got to lay the foundation for, you know, this prior consistent statement coming in um, under the rules of evidence. And he did lead defense counsel down that path, and once... You know, the defense got there. They were able to play this prior consistent statement. Clearly, it was the subject of motions in limine and evidentiary motions before the trial. It wasn't going to be coming in unless this foundation were laid. And the judge helped the defense, gave him a little lifeline here, and allowed them to do so. Yeah, so as a prosecutor, what you want to do is think about your case and the evidence. And when you have these lesser included, you're risking a compromised verdict where the jury is going to, you know, acquit on the top count, the count that you really care about, and return verdicts on the lesser included. So this was such a strong case for the prosecution. I understand why they only went with that first-degree murder, first-degree attempted murder, because anything less 
would really be a loss for them. Uh, last thing you want is a manslaughter. And then in terms of the defense, given how strong the evidence was for the prosecution, the state in this case, I would have loved to go the mitigation route. Try to get Josh off on just a manslaughter charge. So, but again, they really went for the home run and they swung and they missed. Yeah, so. I think, you know, that, that was my thought, was that it is somewhat more believable that he did just, everything piled on top of one another. All the events that were taking place between Joshua Aid and his ex-girlfriend. Now, you know, on that day, she decided she's kicking him to the curb, literally, or at least his stuff. And now you can't come to the, the scene of the Tahoe. You can't come see this new guy you think is my boyfriend work on the Tahoe. All of that's building. He gets to the scene, bam. Then he just, was it, was it some sort of like, look how ineffective the cops are in doing a search, that they're distracted by these other things? Yeah, Michael, I think that's it. It's a sloppy investigation. They put this officer on the stand. You know, he's going through the house. You know, you don't find this gun. You know, Rebecca's missing gun. That's what the, the story is here. Uh, I love what the prosecution did to rebut that, obviously, saying, look, she just shot in the face, you know, and this missing gun that she manages to hide after she shot. So, uh, yeah, not particularly effective. I think this was sort of just, uh, again, part of the defense strategy of just attacking law enforcement, attacking the investigation, saying it was sloppy, you haven't done their job. Yeah, and, and on the gun front, uh, you know, Rebecca did have guns. She had five guns. Four of them were found in the search of her home. Eventually, uh, one was with an aunt, I believe. Uh, what, if any, appellate issues do you see in this pretty straightforward case? Very straightforward case, you know. It, again, Taylor said it best, grasping at straws. You know, they're going to throw something together. Um, but I don't see any appellate issues here. None of the evidence that came in for the state was questionable in any way. Um, again, we don't really see any issues with juror misconduct. Hopefully, jurors don't speak out like they did in the Chauvin case. But I don't see anything right now. i got to defer to Taylor to see if he can come up with something as a defense attorney. But this looks to be locked and loaded potential life sentence for the state here. Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, you know, when we think about appeals, as I've said before, the jury instructions are quite often the, the number one reason for appeal. Um, on, on, on a redirect or a cross of this, this statement when the defense makes it, maybe what, what are you going to do with that? I mean, you, you, um, you're really asking the jury to go beyond what you're hearing. I don't know if they can do that. They have to take it at face value. What can you do with it? Yeah, I mean, the cross for the state is very easy, right? Because if someone, let's just go through the defense's story. You know, James comes first, really doesn't say anything, starts punching Josh, right? And then uh, you have John that comes with some object and some tomahawk motion, and the third person that shows up with a gun is Rebecca. You know, if I'm being attacked by someone's father, I'm going to direct anything I'm saying to my assailant, the father. I don't turn my attention to you know, my ex-girlfriend, who is the assailant's daughter, and say, hey, what are you doing when someone else is attacking me? So I understand why they had to do something with this statement, uh, A for effort, but D for execution. He was shaking his head. They should know. <laughs> when you call, you make a call, they give that announcement, this call can and will be recorded. But they <laughs> always... The defendants always make these incriminating phone calls, and we love it as prosecutors. I always have my agents go through those jailhouse calls, and we always get great information. And obviously, that all came out because Josh got on the stand and testified. It wasn't just that phone call. He had the call after he shot everyone. He made another call to his friend where he admitted to shooting them, didn't say anything about self-defense. So uh, I'm sure the prosecutors in this case love those jailhouse calls as much as I used to. A gun detail, uh, Nima, was in the rewrite. You know, the first version, that, that was not involved. But then uh, they went to editing, and they had to add that back in. I, still, I, I mean, I just get the feeling this guy thinks he's got it all wired, got it all figured out. I agree. And, you know, when the defendant testifies, the jury is just going to focus on his or her testimony. They forget about all the other witnesses. The entire case comes down to that testimony, and he did an incredibly poor job. You know, he couldn't even admit basic facts, you know. He got away. Well, I didn't mean he actually got away. Or when I called my ex-girlfriend 49 times in one day, that doesn't mean I was obsessed with her or stalking her. I was just trying to get through, you know? So he was unable to even admit just basic sort of things that everyone would have to admit to give him 
some semblance of credibility. It was just lie after lie. And I like what the prosecution did. They didn't argue with them. They didn't get combative. What she did was just keep giving him rope to allow him to hang himself because the jury could see right through all those yeah, lies. So, uh, <laughs> you know, this is a state action, and, and, and it's far more lenient, at least not, not only in the sentencing, but in the likelihood of being released. I do not believe, I'm going to have to double check my sources here, Wisconsin, I do not believe is a life without parole possibility. So there's a chance he could get out unless they make the murder charge uh, consecutive with the attempted murder and you end up with multiple, multiple, uh, multiple uh, lives effectively. So what do you think will happen with this guy? There's no evidence he has a prior uh, history, criminal record. What do you think? What are your thoughts, Nima, on sentencing? You know, yeah, Wisconsin, obviously, not, not a capital state, so it's going to be life at worst for Josh here. I think if you're the judge, you've got to sentence him to life. I mean, this was clearly premeditated, right? You went over there with the intent to shoot and kill these people. Um, you know, you have three victims, two of which are lucky. Frank, very fortunate to drive on the head or face, and... The fact that he got up there, perjured himself, tried to mislead this jury, that's something that's going to upset a lot of judges and anger them. You know, this isn't someone that came and just said, listen, this is a woman that I love. You know, I I was heartbroken. I, I, I snapped. This was wrong. You know, like, I can't believe I've you know, affected this family. You know, because what is he really going to say in sentencing? He's either going to come and admit to completely perjuring himself during the trial and you know, trying to obstruct justice. Um, or he's going to say nothing because he's got to preserve the record for appeal and the judge is going to slam him, which is what I expect to happen. I do. I like to get close to those jurors. Not too close, but certainly establish that relationship. Credibility is incredibly important. And, you know, I, I agree with Taylor that you, you got to establish that rapport. And either hiding behind the podium or the lectern, not the way to do it. I'm just glad that Ms. Nash actually stood up and didn't uh, deliver her closing seated, which... Seems like most of the examination and cross-examination during this case was just seated. Obviously, did that in federal court. You know, a judge would call a district judge would call the marshals and have you taken away. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, contrasting styles. You know, everybody has their way in the courtroom. So let's see how Mr. Seaman did. A little touch of his closing argument. Here's the defense. They had no reason to lie. I don't know if I agree with that. I think they had lots of reasons to lie. This guy tried to kill them. Why wouldn't they want to stick it to him, even if he truly was defending himself? Nemo, what do you think? Absolutely. That's the one point that I disagree with. You don't want to overextend yourself as a prosecutor, make a statement like that, especially when it's clear that, you know, if really self-defense were, you know, the, the actual facts of what happened and, you know, whether it's John or James or Rebecca as the initial aggressors and assailants, they would have criminal culpability. So they would have every reason to lie, um, even if they didn't want to stick it to Joshua, which I'm sure they wanted to because they were shot in the face. But you know, otherwise, I thought the summation was very effective. Um, we talked about the intent to show up with the laser. You're pointing it at someone's head, not what someone typically does when they're trying to defend themselves. And I really liked how she addressed reasonable doubt. We know that was going to come up in the defense. She painted two very different stories. You know, the state story, what was reasonable, and the defense, which was very unreasonable that this, you know, self-defense happened and that Josh didn't call law enforcement right away like someone typically would do. But what does he do? He goes to the gas station, picks up a six-pack of beer, and goes home. So I, I really like how she handled that part of the case. Yeah, and again, she has so much Nima, to work with. If you listen to the story about Joshua Aid and his behavior, uh, I would believe that she wants to get rid of him, you know? Uh, <laughs> she can't shake this guy. He will not it's take no for an answer. Reason. And so I kind of believe that maybe she would want to enlist the help of family members to get rid of him. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Here's someone that is going to keep coming, keep coming, keep showing up, keep calling. He's not going to take no for an answer, and the only thing that'll stop him is either a punch or a bullet. So, um, again, I like that argument potentially for the defense. You kind of spin the, uh, you know, Joshua's kind of aggression um, and use it as a defense, but obviously not effective with the jury ultimately. But I like the argument, Michael. You 
obviously I've been watching this case and <laughs> you have that uh, defense attorney mentality there. You would have done a much better job than Aid's own attorney. Well, I would have I would have stood up. I, I give him that. I would have I would have stood. Um, you know, is that satisfying for the victims in this case? And I, you know, it's tough because you hear you have someone with no criminal history, you know, significant military history, decorated veteran. You know, obviously there is some history of violence, and you know, he's a he's a sociopath, I mean, based on his testimony and how he conducted himself at trial. But you know, I think that if he were to get a sentence of at least 25 years, that would be the minimum. I mean, anything less than that is a miscarriage of justice. But 30, 40 plus years in prison, I think that would be justice. Um, again, it's going to depend on how he carries himself. But if he's Nima Romani, uh, former federal prosecutor, Taylor Koss, uh, buddy, good to see you again. Criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor. Fascinating case, and you guys uh, bring a great mix to uh, to the story. Thank you so much.